Доброе утро. Some say that Bulgarian is the language of the future, but others in this room, they say it's French, Spanish, Italian, English, and something like that. Anyway, just to cut a long story short, since today we are still living in the present, I will be speaking the language of the past today, namely English. Apologies for those ones coming from England. Uh, however, uh, let me praise the words of those who said Zero waste is already existing, and it's already working now. Zero waste is not only a vision. It's not only a vision. It's also an operational approach in order to uh, implement separate collection, recycling, composting, reduction, redesigning of the system, and go towards maximization in, uh, the man of efficiency in the management of resources and minimization of the waste to be disposed. And you can see the subtitle, well, it can be hardly seen. Blame it on the never-ending story. Microsoft's Windows against Apple iOS, against uh, Open Office. However, it's the global vision and the local practice which are blending. We are fully and truly in a global perspective. Think globally, act locally. Uh, when talking about resource management, today, nowadays, we are totally bombed daily by different concepts, arguments, such as circular economy, such as industrial ecology, which wants, through a cascading approach, which wants to mimic what happens in nature. Uh, it wants to use the byproducts of a given industrial process to become the substrate for another process, thereby minimizing disposal. It's also a matter of cutting costs, you know, besides making the benefit for the environment. Cradle to cradle, redesign goods and services uh, with the purpose, with the aim of reducing the final wastage of materials and resources. And zero waste, which wants to pick them all, and blend them into an effective uh, performing system. Uh, but what is waste basically for a zero waster? This comes, this is, is a very nice picture I picked from the website of uh, Zero Waste Romania. There are no Romanians today with us. They are deeply engaged and busy with their local fights against incineration nowadays in Romania. But they have got this very nice picture which I dared to pick and blend into my presentation. Because to us, basically, waste is a bunch of opportunities for the future. So we never surrender to the idea that there is something which is not recyclable, compostable, reusable. If there is anything like that, we want it to be redesigned in order to make it recyclable, compostable, reusable in the future. And so the kids, they may take benefit from uh, learning from waste, from waste paper in this respect. We can benefit from recycling materials which are in our waste. But talking about zero waste, of course, the decision makers, the policy makers sometimes may be puzzled because they may say, how can I turn a zero waste into a planning concept, into a planning principle? There is nothing as zero waste, you know, this seems unrealistic, fanciful. But if we look at the progresses we did in the last few uh, decades, you know, this is basically summing up my professional commitment as a person who was promoting separate collection and recycling. And uh, if I remember, when we started getting involved in separate collection, we had some early recycling schemes in the early 90s. And they were basically separately collecting glass and paper. And this was delivering around 15% separate collection. Then in 1993, we introduced the first Italian curbside scheme, which was separating also the organics. And we did the big jump, uh, remarkably beyond 50%, up to 65%. Then a few years later, we introduced a transparent bag for the collection of residual waste in order to check that nothing that is compostable and recyclable ends up into the waste to be disposed. And we gained another further 10% in uh, separate collection rates. Then we introduced the pay as you throw systems, which pushed us uh, further up by another 10%. And now we have got some zero waste municipalities, which with the continued commitment to redesigning the system for continued optimization of the system itself, they are hitting the high 80s, sometimes around and beyond 90% and beyond separate collection. So, 
it's much more the road we already went on than the road which is still left to, to go, isn't it? But in the end of the story, there is a clear direction and we need to keep ready to be more ambitious and more confident day by day. This is why we coined, I hope you can see this one, because that's fundamental, and this captures the spirit of zero waste. We coined a statement. Zero waste is more the journey than the destination. In zero waste, of course, the attention is drawn right away to the number, zero. And it's important to have the number there, because that's our ultimate goal. But what matters is the continued commitment to go that direction. However, Zero waste has been legitimated at the highest institutional levels by now in the European Union. Here we were, that was March 2013, we were at the European Parliament presenting the Zero Waste European Network. I was on in the podium alongside Jean-Marc, Simon, and uh, there was Potocnik, uh, the second left on the first row in the audience. Potocnik, then Commissioner for the Environment. A few days later, he posted a tweet on his Twitter profile stating that good waste management needs good will and good organization, we know, but then most importantly, zero waste is completely possible. And those of you, and I'm sure most of you, who paid attention to the subtitle of the circular economy package, it was subtitled a zero waste program for Europe. So zero waste has been legitimated at the highest possible institutional level in the European Union. But why there is an increasing focus on zero waste? You know, uh, by the way, this is not the first time I'm here in Bulgaria to deliver presentations in past times. I was here to talk about operational optimization of separate collection systems, design of composting facility, operational optimization of recycling facilities, the possibility of composting to contribute to uh, tackling climate change, and so on and so forth. All of those scientific angles in waste management. So some may think, Enzo Favorino got insane. He's talking about zero waste. He's not a researcher anymore. Nothing like that. Zero waste has got a sound scientific background, and this is why I'm chairing a scientific committee which is providing support to Zero Waste Europe. And there are so many, so many reasons to, uh, to, to go on with a zero waste program. Of course, most of us, we are very sensible to the environmental benefits of proper management of these cards. That's uh, probably the primary instance which is in our commitment to zero waste. But then there are the local economic benefits. The more you recycle, the more you tend to keep the value of materials in the local communities. The occupational implications, the green jobs. The extended impact assessment, which was published by the European Union, it was mentioning 180,000 new jobs just for the increase of the material recovery targets from 50% to 70%, to be added on top of the 300,000 new jobs, which were already calculated for setting the target at 50%. So it's 480,000 new jobs in Europe. It's basically, roughly, in the direct uh, uh, occupational implications, one new job per 1,000 people. And then there, is the, there, there are the indirect jobs, for instance, the technology suppliers, those building the recycling facilities or composting facilities, those redesigning the industrial production, and so on and so forth. So it's worth keeping ambitious in this respect. And then there is the, probably what's getting on top of the political agenda at the European level and in various national governments, which is the need to secure the supply of raw materials. Because we are really living in a, um, also, of course, uh, the need to save energy and to reduce greenhouse gases. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, policies which are subsidizing the energy savings we may achieve through recycling. There are energy subsidies for producing renewable energy. And this is diverting much of the organics to incineration, for instance, because they say, yeah, we produce renewable energy and we replace fossil fuels. But they forget how much more energy would have been saved with related savings in, in, in terms of greenhouse gases 
through recycling and composting. So we need to keep it in mind when planning policy making. Uh, but going back to the resource scarcity crisis, this is becoming really a nightmare for the European economy. You know the, uh, that Europe has got a, also a strategy on the so-called critical materials, which are materials which are incredibly important, fundamental for European production, but we are not producing them, so we have to import them from outside. And here we have a problem, ladies and gentlemen, because we have got the growing economies, China, Brazil, India, Mexico, Russia, and so on and so forth, and they say, we want our share of the cake. So we don't want to give you any more the biggest share of oil, metals, rare earths, whatever. And this is why we have to turn the linear economy into a fully circular economy. The primary instance for circular economy at the European level was the need to secure the future for industrial production in Europe. But of course, we may say from the environmental angle, which is the most important for us here today, that never ever as today, economy and ecology are working hand in hand. And circular economy and zero waste are providing the, the blending of the two. Okay, uh, what was tabled in the circular economy package, which was issued in July 2014? A material recovery target increased to 70%. 70% material recovery net of the process rejects, so this means around 75 or 80% separate collection. For packaging waste, 80%. That's not for tomorrow. That, that was set, uh, the deadline was set at 2030. But 15 years in terms of infrastructure for the system means almost nothing. We have to start planning in that direction, non, not in other directions. Otherwise, we get locked in the need to feed incinerators and disposal facilities. A target on food waste prevention by 30% at 2025 and mandatory separate collection of the organics by 2025. Okay, as you can see, this is basically a zero waste program. Mind the fact that these are the minimum targets. Once you get there, you will never stop on the edge of nothing, you know. But you will go further and further. Once you are at 70%, you celebrate one day, and the next day you plan how to get to 75 and then to 80. That's the true spirit of zero waste, the journey much more than the final destination. However, you may know the new commission withdrew the package in last December, saying they are preparing a more ambitious package. I'm the happiest man in the world. If they want to set the recycling targets at 120%, I will sure agree with that, 120% recycling target. Anyway, we don't know yet what will be the final number which will be tabled in the package, but we know the direction. We have to keep ready for ever-increasing recycling targets, recycling rate, composting rate, separate collection rate, and minimization of residual waste. How does zero waste work? Uh, there's many different ways to describe uh, uh, the operations in zero waste, uh, but to sum it up, I like the four R's. Here you have got three. The fourth is hidden because it's the most important one. But the three first R's, they are well known. They have been embedded in European strategies so far since 1975, the first European Waste Framework Directive, and it's reduce, reuse, recycle. Then according to the European directives, uh, the, the directives, they say, okay, we come up with some residual waste and we have to dispose of it in a safe way, possibly getting some energy from that. But this is where zero waste steps in and overcomes the current European strategy. Because we insert the fourth and most important R of redesign. Because if there is anything which is left inside residual waste, we want to make it recyclable, compostable, or reusable in the near future. Sometimes it's on the level of responsibility of the community. Improve your separate collection systems. Very often, it's at the level of responsibility of industrial production. Redesign your industrial production in order to make your goods, your services more recyclable and with less wastage of resources. 
This turns into the operational programs of municipalities. What do the zero waste communities do? And we have got hundreds across Europe. There will be one of the next presentations talking about the zero waste communities. But this is basically what's inserted in the zero waste programs for, uh, for, uh, for communities. Curbside collection, collection at the doorstep, which gives responsibility to the citizens, much more than just big skips kept permanently on the road, which give no responsibility to the citizens. And this should include the organics. Waste prevention practices, which are in the uh, level of responsibility of communities, home composting, promote water from the tap, promote sustainable management of events, not throw away dishes and cutlery at local events. Let's use reusable dishes and cutlery or at, or at least compostable ones. Pay as you throw, which makes another little big jump towards zero waste after you implement curbside collection. But then keep checking composition of residual waste. What is residual waste? Why are there materials still in residual waste? Shall I improve something in separate collection or shall I send a message to the industrial production for better design of the, uh, of the production system? So uh, we will have two messages, one for the municipalities and one for the level of industrial responsibility. Uh, and this is working already. Uh, this is a chart taken from Capanori, which was the first municipality to adopt a zero waste commitment in Europe back in 2007. Here you can see there were a couple of big jumps. The first one here, they introduced curbside collection to slightly more than 500 kilograms. And they increased the separate collection rate, the blue bar. And then a second step was introduction of pay as, as you throw systems, which further reduced the total amount of waste and further increased the separate collection rate. But most importantly, The total effect, which is much more worthwhile than the separate collection rate, is minimization of residual waste in kilograms per inhabitant and year. Because that's the matrix, the parameter, that blends the efforts on both waste reduction and separate collection. We will go back to this one. Uh, so these are uh, the, possible, the possible actions to reduce waste at the level of responsibility of the single communities. Uh, there is an increasing focus on the management of nappies because probably you don't know, but nappies and uh, absorbent hygiene products make up, of, make up around uh, 3 to 5% of municipal solid waste around Europe. So try to consider a zero waste community achieving 90% separate collection. Absorbent hygiene products would make up around 50% of their total residual waste. That's why it's so important whenever you implement a zero waste scheme also to consider doing something on nappies. For the moment we are promoting washable nappies, then we know uh, we can't compel everybody to use the washable nappies because they will have to wash them themselves. 60%, 70% are happy to do that. There's 30 to 40%, they say, no, I am a commuter, I work downtown and I get back home at eight o'clock at night, I don't want to wash the nappies. So we are working concurrently on parallel threads such as the compostable nappies, the recyclable nappies. There are critical issues in any such strategy. But you may understand that the fact itself, there are so many working threads on the issue of nappies. It means that circular economy and circular thinking is already working its way. It's already working its way. Try to consider if there is an incinerator to feed, there would be no commitment to reduce nappies because there is the monster to feed, the incinerator. This is why we are basically against incineration. It's nothing ideologic. The problem is that with incineration, you get locked in the need to feed it for 20 or 30 years with put or pay contracts. Either you deliver a certain tonnage or you will have to pay for that anyway. And so there will be no commitment on recycling separate collection and so on. Uh, composition analysis of residual waste, uh, this is a well-known case history with the coffee capsules in uh, one of our zero waste communities. We found out that due to the ever-changing life habits, there is an increasing percentage of coffee capsules inside residual waste. Okay, 
we can live with that. Huh? We are not telling people, forget about the coffee machines and something like that. I like the mocha, the traditional way of producing coffee. But there's many people using the coffee capsules. So let's make the coffee capsules recyclable and compostable. Because in the coffee capsule, you have got a recyclable part, which is polypropylene in this case, or aluminum in the case of Nespresso. And you have got a compostable part, which is the coffee grounds. But once they are kept together, they are neither compostable nor recyclable. Therefore, we sent a letter to the coffee makers telling them, hey, this is your responsibility. We are already achieving 85% recycling. Would you take on your responsibility, sir, or we send the next letter to the main newspapers? They called, us, they called us the next day. And so there are many work, different working threads on the recyclable coffee capsules, the self-standing coffee grounds, or lately, a very big coffee maker did the compostable coffee capsule. So once again, zero waste produced a feedback to industrial production in order to make them take on the responsibility for better design of their goods and services. Separate collection, anyway, is the real backbone of zero waste because it's the big jump, as I already told you, and there is no way to achieve consistent recycling rates if you don't include curbside collection, collection at the doorstep, and this must include the organics. Without the organics, no way to get consistently beyond the 50%. But the, the role of organics is key under different angles. The quantitative angle, because they still make up most of municipal solid waste in Europe, and the bubble in Southern Europe and Central Eastern Europe. Uh, in many rural districts in Southern Europe, we find remarkably more than 50% organics in municipal solid waste. An operational importance because once you minimize the organics in residual waste, because you take them out through separate collection, so you may reduce the collection frequency for residual waste, which means cost optimization. Collection rounds for residual waste are one of the most important cost items in the in the total cost of waste management. And you exert a further driving effect for better separation of the dry recyclables, paper, glass, plastics, and metals. Uh, also qualitative standpoint, qualitative importance, because once you reduce the organics in some residual waste, residual waste becomes more workable. It's less dirty. And therefore, you may also recover further materials from residual waste. For instance, the case of toys. That's not packaging waste, so it's usually it's not covered by separate collection schemes. But it's plastics, anyway. And if you get the residual waste sufficiently clean, you may recover such materials also from residual waste in order to maximize material recovery. This is Ljubljana. A separate collection of the organics is being widespread across Europe. For the moment, it's uh, the mainstream option in most of Central Europe and in many Southern European countries. Uh, and it's now working its way also in the big cities. There will be a Slovenian presentation about the case of Ljubljana, first the zero waste capital in Europe. This is separate collection of the organics in high rise buildings in Ljubljana. And the case which is making a big noise now is Milan. Milan totals a population of 1.4 million inhabitants. They started separate collection of the organics, uh, splitting the town in four quarters. The first quarter, totaling a population of 350,000 people, started in November 2012. Then the second quarter in June 2013, November 2013, and then the last one, June 2014. In Milan, 100% of the population is already served by separate collection of the organics. So it, it's doable. New York City themselves, they are doing separate collection of the organics. I, uh, yeah, this is one of the pictures from separate collection in Milan, of course. Uh, this is the importance of making the system comfortable and tidy. These are biodegradable bags in order to keep the system safe and not to cause any yuck, any nuisance in delivery of your food waste into the beans. Uh, but I was mentioning briefly New York. In New York, there's already 200,000 people who are separating uh, food waste. And now there is a new plan which was issued by Bill de Blasio, the mayor from New York. He tabled 90% diversion from landfills by 2030. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a zero waste program, isn't it? 
And of course, the separate collection of the organics will be the backbone for them in order to get that far. But you know the lyrics from the song from Frank Sinatra and Liza Minnelli. If you can make it there, you make it anywhere. You make it anywhere, really. They do that in New York. So why not in Sofia, in Beograd, in Moscow, and so on and so forth. OK, the last bit of my presentation, just to make you confident, I already told you, always be ambitious. And to be ambitious, one must be confident that something is feasible, it's viable, and it's cost competitive. Of course, received wisdom tells us separate collection is important for the environment, but it's terribly expensive. Nothing like that, nothing like that. This chart is uh, summing up the results of the official survey of region Lombardy, which is the most populated region in Italy, 10 million inhabitants with a total uh, number of municipalities of 1,547. So the statistical basis, it's incredibly reliable. Milan town is placed in Lombardy. And you can see that at the increase in separate collection rates, there is a decrease in the unit cost which is transferred to persons, to households. So separating and recycling implies a savings. Because the cost of incineration is high, the cost of landfilling for the moment is still comparatively low in many Central Eastern European countries. But you know that in the near future, on account of the implementation of the landfill directive, 30 years of financial liability of the landfill owner, obligation on pretreatment of the waste which has to go to landfilling, landfilling will be terribly more expensive than now. And recycling will become for sure cost competitive. So this is the rationale for the savings on disposal. But let me go to the last bit. There will be also the presentation on our Zero Waste Champion District later on, uh, namely Contarina, which is in northeastern Italy. Uh, so I will not go into details of how they achieved uh, impressive results. But I want to draw your attention on the new metrics for, uh, uh, for Zero Waste programs and for optimized programs for separate collection, because if we only consider separate collection, that would, that would, then there would be no commitment on waste reduction, no commitment to, to promote home composting because it takes organics away from separate collection rates. No commitment on promoting water from the tap because it takes plastics and glass away from separate collection rates. But you know, the best waste is the waste which is not produced. So we, first and foremost, we have to keep the emphasis on waste reduction. So in Contarina, they went up to 85% separate collection as the district average on a population which totals 530,000 people, 15 different municipalities. But with the concurrent commitment, I'm sorry, this is not working. Uh, we are skipping one slide. Uh, pity, I will tell you, trust me. With the commitment also waste reduction, they went down to 50 kilograms per inhabitant in general residual waste. And most importantly, they have got the commitment to go further and further because they adopted the zero waste commitment. So uh, the last message will be, since they tell us now, let's consider incineration to reduce reliance on landfilling. They say there might be a zero waste to landfill strategy. That's not zero waste. Hmm? As if you build an incinerator, then you are locked in the need to feed the incinerator instead of feeding soils with organics, feeding MRFs, material recovery facilities with uh, uh, the dry recyclables and so on and so forth. But let me tell you a story from Europe. In Europe, there is a country which is well renowned and sometimes praised for being an environmentally advanced country. In many instances it is, but not in waste management, because they send 60% of their municipal solid waste to incineration. Unfortunately, what is not shown by open office is the starting, the starting amount of municipal solid waste, which is more than 700 kilograms per inhabitant in year. Unfortunately, we always talk about percentages, but we should be discussing the amounts in kilograms per inhabitant in year. So, 700 kilograms per inhabitant in year. 60% incinerated makes 420 kilograms per person in year going to incineration. 25% is slags and ashes. 
So they come up with 105 kilograms per inhabitant year of slugs and ashes. And at least some of that has to go to a landfill, at least the fly ashes, but also many of the slugs, the, the bottom ashes. Whereas in our zero waste champion district, Contarina, they are recycling 85%, starting from slightly less than 400 kilograms per inhabitant in year. So they come up with residual waste around 50 kilograms per inhabitant in year. And residuals get processed through a uh, material recovery biological treatment site. So to landfill actually goes only 25 kilograms per inhabitant in year. So who is winning the race towards the zero landfill? Red pill or green pill? Red pill or green pill? Please. Green pill, green pill, forever and more. And most importantly, again, open office not showing. OK, they are committed to go further because there is no incinerator there. So the zero waste goal was set at a further reduction by 80% of residual waste at 2023, which means going down to 10 kilograms per inhabitant in year by 2023. They will do that. They will do that. I'm also involved in the zero waste board there. And we, we are working, you know, from the operational pragmatic standpoint on what are the critical issues, how to overcome the, them, how to maximize recycling further and further, how to reduce waste and so on and so forth. So they will get there. But I'm quite sure that Bulgaria will get there sooner than them. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Fala.